Good evening from Melbourne. Um, my name is David Commander, and um, I am really delighted to be uh, part of this um, seminar series. I'm very thankful to Catherine to uh, ask me to present here and discuss with you some of the things we are playing with um, in the protein uh, targeted protein degradation field. So let me quickly share my screen um, so we can get going with the presentation. Okay. So what I want to do today is to really explain to you our works in the uh, on on diubiquitinases um, and the opportunities that that come with diubiquitinases, in particular inhibition of DUBs. Um, but before I do this, I want to quickly introduce uh, where I am here. So um, I have moved two and a half years ago to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. So I'm sitting up here in this uh, office up here, you know, and what can I say? We had a beautiful day today. It was a beautiful autumn day, no clouds, no COVID. So this has all been uh, very nice. Um, I am here in Australia and really in the spirit of reconciliation, I should also really acknowledge uh, the uh, traditional owners and custodians of the land from which I give this talk. And these are the uh, Wujanjiri people of the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne. Um, and these are the um, um, traditional owners and I'm, I'm paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So. When they asked me to set up this ubiquitin signaling division, it was really great because we could really instill um, uh, a bit of a vision and what we wanted to do here. And I just want to share this with you. So in the ubiquitin research, as you know, there are still so many new things to discover. And clearly we want to do, uh, become a, a, an academic center of excellence here. But then ubiquitination is a really difficult field of, uh, of study in the way that I'm going to explain to you. And what would be great for us is to really take a, a wonderful translational institute like Rehai and enable it with the latest ubiquitination um, techniques and, and methodologies. But then also we want to really translate our findings and generate small molecules and probes and eventually new medicines um, that target the ubiquitin proteasome system um, and ubiquitination more generally. The areas we are working in in the division are um, standard areas that everybody's working on. So neurodegeneration, inflammation and cancer. And here it's important to realize, of course, that Rehai has extremely strong um, background and, and setup for inflammation and cancer. Neurodegeneration is potentially a bit of a, more of a new thing for Rehai and we are happy to contribute to that. Right now we are um, uh, five labs, four labs. Um, um, for uh, academic labs and uh, we also have an entrepreneur scientist who really is uh, supposed to spin out uh, companies uh, from us. Um, we do have an open position so we are actively recruiting another group leader uh, um, in the next couple of months and I'm really hoping that um, some of you will apply. So why would Rehai have a ubiquitin division and dedicate so much effort into this. And I think the, the answer to this is pretty obvious. The ubiquitin code is a fairly complex beast and really um, there is lots to be learned both on the basic research side, but then also on the application side that it makes perfect sense to, to work on this for, for many, many years to come and really um, uh, understand what it all means for human biology. So the ubiquitin code, as you know, uh, becomes uh, um, is basically starting with this molecule here on the right, which is ubiquitin, and all of these different lysine residues can be ubiquitinated, and that leads to the formation of these ubiquitin chains. Homotypic ubiquitin chains are unfortunately not color coded in cells, so it's already difficult to distinguish between these different ubiquitin chains. However, it has also become clear in the last couple of years that it's considerably more, um, more complex than this. And this comes the moment you go beyond two ubiquitins, you can start with mixed chains and branched chains. And I'm going to discuss this at the end, at the end of the talk a little bit more in detail. Um, but then, of course, these are all proteins and um, proteins can also be modified by additional ubiquitin-like modifiers like SUMO and NET8. 
proteins can be acetylated, and ubiquitin can be acetylated and phosphorylated and potentially has many other post-translation modifications as well. So a lot of this is really understudied and unstudied um, and needs to be um, discovered. So really we've set out um, now a, a long time ago um, to understand the specificity in the ubiquitin system in a bit more detail. So we wanted to understand the ubiquitin code by going back to the enzymes and proteins that regulate the specificity with the idea that if we find specific proteins, we can then work backwards and understand what these ubiquitin signals are doing. And for this, we were looking at E2s and E3s that make these ubiquitin chains. Um, we were working on uh, ubiquitin binding domains and we are working on ubiquitin binding domains that read these ubiquitin signals. And of course, we will be working, we will be talking mostly about the deubiquitinases today, which remove these ubiquitin signals. And then I mentioned to you, um, um, that ubiquitin can be modified by additional post-translational modifications, for example, phosphorylation and acetylation. But here in this field, we really have, this is pretty much a black box. We know one kinase and potentially a phosphatase for ubiquitin um, that uh, puts ubiquitin, uh, that puts a phosphate onto ubiquitin, and that is, that is pink one, um, which is uh, quite well studied these days. But really, uh, this is uh, pretty much an open box and, and an area to watch in the next couple of years. So targeted protein degradation is, of course, starting to get at the drug discovery part of the ubiquitin system and really looking at the opportunities that arise from modulating this very important process. And this very important process is really the degradation of proteins. So E3 ligases lead to ubiquitination and ubiquitination leads to degradation. And we can, this happens for any protein all the time. However, the idea is now that if you could activate or redirect E3 ligases to destabilize proteins, for example, an oncogene, then we're talking about protax. And I don't need to tell you about protax because this is a targeted protein degradation series. Um, but of course, you all know how this works, that you basically get a ligand to your protein uh, recruit an E3, which is not a normal E3 for this protein, um, and that leads to the degradation. There is an alternative way to do the same thing, and this is by identifying the deubiquitinase that would normally regulate this protein and take the ubiquitin chains of this particular protein of interest. If you then inhibit this deubiquitinase, again, you are pushing the uh, equilibrium in this direction and the protein will be degraded. So this is much more traditional drug discovery because we want to have inhibitors for deubiquitinases, but we are still working on proteins here which cannot necessarily be targeted themselves. And that includes many proteins for which it will be very difficult to make ligands in the first place. So deubiquitinases are really a very open and a very um, Great opportunity here. First of all, we have about 100 or so. So there's plenty to choose from and plenty of uh, different locations and, and uh, environments that they are in. Pretty much everywhere in the cell, you can find a, a deubiquitinase or many. Um, in addition to this, um, but okay, so one of the very important concepts that I find people get a little bit confused about sometimes is one that I want to really explain to you a little bit. So in deubiquitinases, I think it's fair to do a, a distinction between linkage-specific enzymes. And these enzymes are really proteins that recognize a ubiquitinated protein via the ubiquitin chain itself and take the chain off. They don't really necessarily care about the substrate, they are effectively, um, um, they can regulate linkage types globally, but also because they can only take chains off, often they leave the last ubiquitin on the substrate. So your substrate leaves and stays ubiquitinated. And the enzymes which do this are many of the OTUs that we've studied over the years, some of the MINDI proteins that Yogesh Colato has studied, and also many of the GEMs are specific for k 63 linked ubiquitin chains. On the other hand, 
um, we have substrate specific enzymes. And these enzymes are proteins which will go to the substrate directly. They don't really care about the linkage types. They just take all ubiquitin off and effectively make an unmodified protein. And um, they will also then cleave the first ubiquitin of the substrate. So really they take the proximal ubiquitin off, off as well. And these are of course the USP enzymes. And the ones that we've studied, they are usually very non-specific in their in their um, in the action, and they will really be pretty good as as dubs to take everything off. There's a couple of dub families that really had me scratching my head uh, and have scratching my head because I really haven't understood. I can't put them in any of these categories. And there's some really exciting data that I just want to quickly review, um, which has come out, for example, from the Streeter lab. Um, Eric Streeter has published that the UCH enzymes, they might actually be debranching enzymes. And I will come back to branches later, but really it looks like that they have some specific activities to remove branched ubiquitin chains um, from proteasomal substrates, in this particular case, UCH37. And then there's a really cool paper from Satpal Virdi's lab uh, who looks at um, O-linked ubiquitination, so um, ubiquitination of serine and threonine. And what he found in, in, in this paper that came out earlier this year was that um, Josephines, which are really a bit of a weird uh, dub family, are really not very good, and I, I agree on this, are not very good at taking ubiquitin of lysine residues, but he found that they are very, very good at taking ubiquitin of threonine residues. So, and I think that's also very exciting to potentially have a family of dubs here for non-lysine ubiquitination events. But let's come back to the USP enzymes. In the USP enzymes, um, we have these uh, substrate-specific enzymes, and the idea would be that if we can find dubs for some of these famous oncogenes, these enzymes should be pretty good drug targets. Because again, as I explained earlier, they should really lead to the normal degradation and push the degradation of these, of these, um, of these proteins. For USP dubs, we have, uh, again, uh, this is the largest family of human dubs. There's 54 of them in, in, in human cells, um, 56. Two of them are pseudodubs, so they have no catalytic residues. Uh, some of them cleave not ubiquitin, but IG15 or SUMO. Um, and as you can see here, the domain structure, so the collect domain is in red, uh, and then we have um, lots of different kinds of domains in them. And these domains are considered to be the important domains that bring them to the right place and bring them to their substrate where they can, where they can act. So um, what I want to review with you in the first part of the talk is what we have done with DUP inhibitors. And for this, I need to introduce a, a really a great um, alliance of researchers and industry that I was part of. So this was that we call this a DUP alliance. Um, this was led by Cancer Research uh, Technology in the UK and was a, uh, um, a collaboration with Pharma Therapeutics in Boston um, and really also included uh, a number of labs from Europe, including Benedict Kessler, Michael Clayton, and Sylvie Orbe, Martin Eilers later and Axel Behrens and also Haub Ober's lab. And as I'm sure you've all heard, uh, very sadly, Haub has passed away uh, last year uh, due to cancer. So. This is really a, a massive loss, and I'm, I'm really this is a terrible, uh, terrible loss for the field. Um, however, the DUP Alliance really made some uh, really exciting advances, and it was really good fun. Uh, it's unfortunately been disassembled uh, early last year, um, but I want to show you a couple of things that uh, um, that we found. So. Um, the first thing uh, we've published is uh, an inhibitor for USP7, and this was uh, an inhibitor that uh, this was a, this was a paper that came out with multiple other papers uh, from Genentech, um, but also from Dana Farber, um, to really show that we can have very specific inhibitors for USP7. Why would you want to inhibit USP7? USP7 is a deubiquitinase for MDM2, this very famous E3 ligase that ubiquitinates and degrades the tumor suppressor P53. So if you inhibit USP7, you would be able to, um, so basically the ubiquitin chain actually uh, goes back to MDM2 and instead of P53, MDM2 is degraded and P53 is stabilized. 
Um, USP7 has many other roles in cells, and, and it's one of the most uh, highly expressed and highly studied drugs in, in any of our cells. So, um, you know, it's not only doing P53, but it's doing many other things. So we set out to do uh, F, uh, we set out to do USP7 inhibitors, and what you could, uh, what we what we ended up with were some beautiful inhibitors that really, in this panel of drugs from Ubiquigen, uh, this company in Dundee, um, uh, would only hit USP7 and wouldn't hit any of the others. And this was also shown in cells by Benedict uh, to show that these inhibitors also in cells do have very similar specificity profiles. Um, this was great, and I should also say that many other labs really arrived at the same conclusions, that um, inhibitors for USP7 can be identified that are highly, highly specific. And that really, I think, was a key message from, from these papers, is that we can actually generate very, very specific DAP inhibitors. Um, so this really opened the field and, and made people realize that uh, we can do it. Um, so, I guess for USP7, it became a little complicated because there were so many different things that USP7 regulated. So, um, there might be other dubs that might have a better or an equally good target rationale. And I'm listing a number of the ones uh, that, um, uh, that spring to mind, I'm listing here. And I think it's really worthwhile to generate, try to generate inhibitors for, for many of these, because even if these are not going into the clinics, they will be tremendously useful reagents and probes to really understand more about biology, because one of the things that we've learned is that with any of the new inhibitors in hand that were specific, we effectively had new biology emerging um, uh, to really explain uh, new features and functions of these enzymes. I here would like to mention two uh, works where uh, my colleagues Michael and Sylvie, uh, cell biologists in Liverpool, um, have uh, used uh, some of these uh, wonderful tools that, that, we, that we generated in the Alliance and discovered really new functions, for example, for USP9X and that it re regulates ribosomal stalling. Um, that was a paper that was published uh, just uh, earlier this month. Um, and also uh, USP30 inhibitors have been made by former, um, and um, uh, for this, uh, with these inhibitors, again, um, showing that USP30 is, a, is an important trigger for pink von parkin mediated mitochondrial ubiquitination, which of course is very important in, in Parkinson's disease. So in all of these papers, the, the compound structures for these specific inhibitors and the characterization of these inhibitors is, is, uh, is described. So I really um, I encourage you to look at these um, publications and, and use these tools. I would like to spend a little bit more on another enzyme that we've been looking at uh, in a bit more detail, which is USP28. Uh, USP28 is already a famous enzyme because it regulates so many very, very important oncogenes, including MYC, June, Notch, and, and Cyclins. And um, people in our alliance, including Martin Eilers and Axel Behrens, really have um, published over the years some very important uh, knockout studies and, and mouse models that really um, uh, um, formalize this link between USP28 uh, and MYC. Um, the inhibitor that uh, we've now um, uh, described in this paper that was uh, published, and it's not published yet, but it's in bioarchives from Axel, uh, put together by Axel and, and Benedict based on their data, shows that if you delete or use this uh, inhibitor, um, you can actually uh, destabilize CMIC. And, and um, this is a very uh, powerful way to, um, to target uh, squamous cell lung carcinoma cells. And I want to show you just a little bit of the data here. So these are SI data, but here's inhibitor data. And with these inhibitors, what's always interesting, and we see this often, is that um, if you treat a DUP with a specific inhibitor, the DUP will actually be um, also um, removed from cells. Um, so it acts sometimes uh, like, a, like a knockdown or knockout. And, you know, MIG levels and June levels um, and other levels um, effectively go down accordingly. This is actually a pretty big deal because 
Um, and I show these kinds of data around the institute here, the cancer researchers get very excited because they would love to have compounds that remove MIG in a similar fashion. Um, Axel was showing, um, uh, Axel was also then uh, doing this in, in mouse xenograft models. And again, the data here is pretty spectacular, where with the compound treated uh, xenograft mice, and this is for three different types of cell lines, human, um, human cell lines injected into, into immunocompromised mice, can show that the, the tumors really can't grow and, and they have uh, effectively um, going away and, and are effectively um, are not present anymore. So this is a very exciting, exciting data and this is really uh, due to the loss of MIG. So there was a little bit of a, um, Hitch here, and that issue comes from the fact that these inhibitors are not as super specific as you can see here. This is a must spec uh, um, assay that is routinely done in Benedict's lab now, but they hit two enzymes, USP25 and USP28. And the reason why this is very difficult to distinguish, and this is sort of where we came in a few years ago, is that these two enzymes, it's really not surprising that they hit at the same time because USB25 and USB28 are essentially identical, are extremely similar to each other. Um, they're both the same length, very, very similar catalytic domain, and I think um, uh, they have a, a high identity and similarity in their, in, their, in their sequences. So this is clearly a gene duplication event with, with two enzymes being, um, um, being generated. I think what's important here is to realize that this is happening all over the all over the genome for these USPs, and there's many USP pairs and and sometimes even even triplets that have very similar sequences that are very hard that would be very hard to to um, differentiate uh, differentiate on. So we ask the question: If we really do, we really have to inhibit USP28, is it a problem that our inhibitors are hitting two enzymes or can we maybe get away with that? Um, and, and what is the differences between these two enzymes? You know, are they really just redundant or are they effectively having a different roles? So the literature tells us that they shouldn't be redundant because first of all, USP28 is in the nucleus and has all these very important nuclear function, whereas USP25 is actually uh, on the plasma membrane and is actually um, um, it's not on the plasma membrane, but it's effectively a, a cytosolic dub that regulates many um, uh, processes in the cytosol. And again, there's uh, many knockout studies done on USB 25 as well. So clearly they, they are quite different uh, functionally. Um, so can we see this? Dif can, we, can we also see these differences um, uh, from biochemical and structural work. And the answer to this is, is yes, we can. And that was some beautiful work, Brutus for structural biology work that Malte Gersh in the lab uh, was, uh, was doing. Um, so what Malte showed was that these USP enzymes have these long insertions and these long insertions form these stalk regions that effectively dimerize um, through this dimerization domain. And for USP28, this then ends up in this uh, molecule, which looks a little bit like a um, like a cherry, I guess that was always our analogy. Um, but really, what we have in USP25 is the same structure, but two of those intersecting with each other, forming a tetramer. And USP25 uh, became even more um, intriguing because these uh, tetramers were not just um, uh, um, forming. In addition to forming these tetramers, there was also an auto-inhibitory sequence whereby one molecule would uh, interact um, in the active site of another molecule to really um, stop the, uh, the second molecule from, from working. So uh, USP25-8 is, is an active dimer, whereas USP25 is inactive. Uh, it's an auto-inhibited tetramer in, in cells. And that it's in cells, Malte was able to show very nicely in, in some... Um, um, SDS uh, page, um, so native page um, analysis. 
So um, I'm not going through uh, all of the data that we had in these papers, but I just want to point you to um, additional papers from um, as the Kiska lab in Würzburg. And these papers really came out back to back with pretty much identical content. And I should also mention that there was another paper on the USB 25 structure in HRCOM uh, a little bit earlier. Um, but um, really one of the additional uh, findings that um, uh, Carolina's lab had was that cancer mutations would actually activate um, these inactivated, these auto-inhibited tetramers of USB 25. And that's actually cancer mutations which, which activate that, which in itself explained a little bit how these tetramers can become active dimers. So um, I guess the conclusion is that um, we can look at these diubiquitinases for USB 25 and USB 28. The, the conclusion was that, well, they are very, very similar. Um, and it's going to be very difficult to generate specific inhibitors for USB 28. But potentially, we don't have to worry so much about it simply because um, they have so different functions. And if we are treating um, cancer, then most people will say, well, as long as MIG goes away, hopefully that is, um, we can hopefully have um, suffer some other effects based on USB 25. But of course, you know, this all needs to be, uh, needs to be considered in, in future work. And there is a possibility to potentially dial in specificity um, through these inhibitors. Okay, so um, to summarize this part, the ubiquitinases um, represent new opportunities to regulate the stability of proteins. Uh, they are an untapped resource for discovery of new medicines, and we can generate specific DUP inhibitors. Um, they have multiple distinct pockets for pharmacological interference, and I think that's a very exciting part that we really have many, many possible ways to inhibit a DUP. And uh, many of our inhibitors worked in very, very different modes of action that I haven't discussed. Um, so we understand this all pretty well. We have good in vitro assays, in vivo assays. So what do we do with this? And I guess this was a question that I was asking myself when I started at Rehi and the double alliance sort of um, imploded. Um, what should we do with all of these uh, all with all of these things? So then along came a pandemic. And in the next part of the talk, I want to describe to you how we are now using our DUP assays to target one of the proteases. Um, uh, and that's of course PL Pro of, of SARS-CoV-2. So this became a um, a very broad rehigh wide uh, effort. And I'm listing here all of the different divisions that have be, that were instrumental and essential to effectively um, um, generate this data and, and really uh, um, uh, move this project forward. So I'm not going to um, discuss with you these still extremely sobering and depressing numbers of how many new cases and how many dead people per day are coming from um, are coming from SARS-2 and COVID-19. Um, the only thing I want to say is that vaccination is amazing and I, I'm, I'm very excited that these vaccines, I think they are a great success story for biomedicine, but really we need additional ways to stop coronaviruses and other viruses. We need um, alternatives to um, vaccines because nobody wants to wait for months when the next coronavirus pandemic hits. And it would be great to have a coronavirus antiviral, for example, that would um, really um, make, make a huge impact. So many people, of course, and I'm sure that many of you are very well aware of this, um, have looked at the proteases uh, of the coronavirus, uh, PLPRO and MPRO, as the perfect drug targets because they are viral proteases that cleave the polyprotein into functional units, and these functional units need to happen in order for the virus to form the replisome. Um, so without 
being able to form the leptosome, there's no um, uh, there's no viral um, there's there's no viral life cycle and, and no um, a replication of the virus, of course, and that effectively means that uh, we would be able to kill the virus. PLPro and MPro are excellent validated drug targets, not only in SARS-2 but also in in uh, previous coronaviruses. And actually, in SARS and MERS, the previous coronaviruses, these proteins have been well studied, um, and and even inhibitors uh, have been described. So we were really starting at a at a very very high um, basis. PL Pro is very interesting to us because it also affects the virus induced host responses, and these are of course inflammation and antiviral signaling. Inflammation is mediated by polyubiquitination. Antiviral signaling uh, leads to interferon stimulated genes, and ISG15 is a ubiquitin like modification um, that the virus is directly targeting through PL Pro and effectively removing these um, activities um, directly. Um, this again has been studied rather well and has been also reviewed very nicely in, uh, in papers from the Mesica lab. Um, and reviews from the Mesica labs that I really encourage you to, to look at if you haven't already done so. Um, so there's a lot known um, about uh, how PL Pro works um, in SARS and, and MERS. So um, a new postdoc started about two weeks before we went into our first lockdown last year in March, um, Teresa Klemm, who came over from Würzburg. And um, she really was in the lab uh, um, while the pandemic hit and within a couple of weeks she really was um, up and running to unleash our entire ubiquitin toolkit on PL Pro. And I'm not going to go through this data because this has all been you know, discussed and published. Um, um, we have a you know, ubiquitination assays and uh, Teresa also solved structures of PL Pro bound to ubiquitin and ISG15. Um, and um, this really was there wasn't a huge number of surprises in this work because it was, again, as I said before, it was very consistent with the SARS PL Pro and the works that had previously been done by Mesica Pagan, uh, by Mesica Lab and Mesica's lab, um, Scott Pagan's lab and, and Chris Lima's lab, labs. And and really, um, um, our focus was from the start to identify PL Pro drugs. So we, we followed three strategies. First of all, like everybody else, we wanted to see whether there is already a drug out there and do a drug repurposing campaign. Then we wanted to see whether the re reported SARS PL Pro inhibitors can do anything against SARS 2 PL Pro. And we want to see whether we can, we wanted to see what we can do with the novel drug discovery. Um, uh, we had to set up an essay in order to do this, and uh, we have we are very fortunate to ho uh, to host the National Drug Discovery Center here at Rehi. This has been led by Guillaume Lesen and Jeff Mitchell. Uh, Kim Laus is the head of the screening team, and this is such a powerful resource for us because this is a really, really uh, extremely advanced way to uh, do drug discovery um, here at Rehi. The essay is a standard rhodamine essay that uh, I'm sure, well, that for example, previously former had established. Um, and how this works is that you basically have a dot that cleaves off this fluorescent group, which then starts to give a signal. Um, and it's a very straightforward essay and our screening team really established this entire essay as a very robust platform within, within four weeks or so, and this is some of the you know, pretty uh, prettier images that they do to to show us um, how beautiful the essay works. Um, with this, we started to screen um, we started to screen small molecules. So first of all, we had to check whether there is already any available drug or small molecule um, clinic uh, a drug um, something that has been in clinical trials was an inhibitor of PL Pro because if we could have skipped all of the development for this that would of course be uh, an, an important uh, an important um, step. Um, the answer to this was um, sobering, um, maybe not so surprising, but effectively we screened uh, an in-house library of available uh, drugs, um, but also the reframe library, which is this um, uh, famous library from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where they collected all of the available um, um, clinically approved uh, compounds. 
And you know, while you will always find some hits, all of these hits are effectively electrophiles, have reactive groups, are assay interfering, um, or are effectively entirely non-specific. So um, out of these 15,000 protein, uh, uh, small molecules that, that we tried, we really couldn't validate any, and we stopped this campaign pretty early on, realizing that there won't be an available drug for PL Pro that we would be happy to put into humans. Uh, we moved on to the previous um, um, uh, PL Pro inhibitors. So SARS and MERS had been looked at by, again, the, the same labs I mentioned previously. Um, they had caused these smaller scale pandemics that, you know, we didn't worry so much about at the time. At least certainly I didn't. Um, and um, these were all academic uh, um, drug discovery efforts. So none of these had been progressed beyond, I guess, hit to lead stage. Um, so we made, we remade some of these uh, best looking compounds and they really worked a treat for us. So um, these are compounds that uh, clearly uh, have a very nice IC50s for PL Pro, uh, SARS-2 PL Pro now. And this is an essay that I think is um, um, really cool to, to, to comment on as well. So um, two floors below me, we have our PC3 facility and this is now a live SARS infection assay where cells are infected with um, SARS-2 and they kill cells, uh, SARS-2 kills cells. This is uh, a Carlos Suisse, I think. Um, remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine can sort of um, fight that uh, response, but our inhibitors are also pretty good at actually um, having a response here um, similar to similar levels with remdesivir. Um, although these are entirely un, um, unrefined compounds. So this was very encouraging, and uh, we've now generated uh, many analogs for these in-house and via medical chemistry uh, CROs. They are structurally enabled. We've got crystal structures with many of these compounds. We have orthogonal assays. Um, they are very clean that they are not hitting any of the human dubs that we've tested. And they have activity in cell-based assays and infection assays. We are generating now, we're starting to look at ATMI properties and also entering some, some new IP space, which of course is always important for your BDO team. Um, but effectively, um, this is sort of uh, going uh, pretty well and we are pretty hopeful that these will be quite um, interesting. Um, the other thing we did was to entirely unleash the entire capacity of the NDDC, the National Drug Discovery Center on PL Pro. And we did a full deck screen um, by uh, mid of August last year, of which we also got 33 hits. We had a couple that also inhibited our counters, counter dub, and that uh, resulted in additional series. And our major front runner is series B at the moment, which came out of the screen with a, with a very nice uh, IC50 and when we structurally enabled this, when we saw the co-crystal structure of this, we realized that they're actually completely uh, hitting a different binding site on PL Pro. And that's, of course, you know, a med chemist's dream that we can really uh, have entirely uh, orthogonal series um, um, ticking along and, and um, progressing towards um, um, med chemistry. So you can imagine that this is a really big effort. Uh, this is now led by a project manager, Uli, who's taken, who's taken this on. And you can see here, this is a basically a list of all the people that are involved. I haven't discussed our ideas about DMS or um, organoid models, but this is all hopefully uh, going to be published um, in the next um, couple of years. And we are really quite dedicated to get to these drugs. So, um, what I want to highlight with this part of the talk is that dub screens are robust and can be established even in academic settings. And I think we were very, uh, I'm very excited that they have been able to do this now because, of course, we are now fully enabled to screen whatever dub we come across, uh, which is which is a very nice um, proposition. Uh, we can generate specific inhibitors, and we've had a lot of fun generating structures, co-crystal structures to really reveal where these drug pockets are. And I think that is something that um, is um, very different from many other drug discovery projects. What we of course now need to do is to move DUP inhibitors into clinical development. And I think that really, uh, we really need to see the, the potency and the power 
of DAP inhibitors in the clinic. Um, I think everybody is a bit scared to put the first one in because that really should, hopefully that works. Um, but I'm sure that in the next couple of years, we will, we will have um, the first uh, couple coming through and fingers crossed they do what they're supposed to do. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, I want to um, discuss some methodologies that hopefully may be useful for some of you looking at ubiquitination. And, you know, looking at some of the previous talks, Ubiquitination is not necessarily featuring in all of these wonderful talks on protax and on targeted protein degradation. It's sort of the thing that needs to happen, but it's really about the protein going away. And I get it. It's a complicated thing. And, you know, as long as the ESV ligase does its job, um, we might not have to worry so much about this ubiquitin thing. OK, I get it. And it's complicated, I know this, and it is uh, actually sometimes even scary. So, um, you know, dealing with a structure like this here, if it, if it exists, would be extremely difficult, uh, um, um, challenging um, and fun, I think, uh, for, for me anyway. But I also want to alert you to the fact that sometimes it probably is a good idea that you really think a little bit about it, simply because we should think of, we should make use of the power of the ubiquitin system and all of these new insights that come. And I just want to highlight here three papers. Um, for example, the, the work from Michael Rapes lab, that branched ubiquitin chains are better at protein degradation. Um, that the proteasome distinguishes between heterotypic and homotypic for example, K11-linked ubiquitin chains, which came out from James Nason's lab in Cambridge. Um, and then also that if you inhibit K6, uh, sorry, if you inhibit a P97, which, you know, will be involved, could be involved in, in, uh, in many degradation processes, you actually generate a lot of K6-linked ubiquitin chains. And K6 chains is just a complete mystery. We can hardly see them in cells. So, but potentially there's, there's a huge opportunity to use K6-linked ESV ligases to actually invoke VCP um, processes. And I think there's, there's a lot to be learned uh, around the different linkage types and the different uh, architectures in these ubiquitin chains. And then finally, I think at the moment we are also seeing, or the last couple of years, we've seen that the rules for what constitutes a good degradation signal are actually uh, being partly rewritten, and people are going away from this idea that, you know, K48 tetra ubiquitin is everything you need. I think this is, um, it's getting a little bit more um, sophisticated than that. Okay, so how can we study ubiquitination? So everybody does that by triptic digest. And if you do a triptic digest of a polyubiquitinated protein, you generate peptides and these peptides you can analyze and you can then say, oh, there was K48 chains, there was K63 chains. But of course, um, and you can also then potentially find this one peptide down here, which is where the ubiquitination site was. Um, we have antibodies uh, that select these uh, GG modified peptides from lysates and that's great. But you really need to be uh, very good at proteomics to, to get through this. And you lose all information on chain architecture. So this is not good because that's not what, what we want. We want to look at branch chains, right? And I can't tell you if this was a branch chain or not after a triptic digest. So I'm referring to this as a grammar of the ubiquitin code. You know, we know the letters, these are the linkages, but we don't really know anything about the grammar of the ubiquitin code. And um, some, in some ways, and one of the ways that we've sort of um, looked at is that we can use ubiquest, which is our method where we use linkage-specific dubs to disassemble or start to disassemble these, these chains and say, okay, this linkage type is involved. And if we put a K63 dub here on this chain, then there's some K6 chains generated. So that must mean that there was a branch somewhere. Okay, so it's a bit more complicated than this, um, but um, this is one of the methods. What can we do about branches? So Michael Rape, together with Vishwa Dixit's labs, have generated uh, bispecific antibodies. And 
they are pretty good uh, for, for doing this. At the moment, there's, I think, one, maybe a couple more by now. But um, there's 28 ways to make a branch. And uh, so we need a couple more tools here. Um, and then, of course, there's a question about what is actually a branch chain? I mean, that this is a branch chain. That's OK. And this is the smallest branch I can think of. But of course, this could be a branch, right, where you have every single molecule is branched off. But this is also a branch structure, right, where you have a K11 and a K48 chain sort of going off in parallel, but they are branched off it here. So that's another way of looking at this. And this is by looking at individual ubiquitin molecules. And then when we do this, we can then see that if I now count the number of ubiquitins that have been modified twice, then I get a very different branched ubiquitin um, numbers game in this one compared to this one compared to this one. So that's a new way to, to look at this. Uh, we can also then with this, for example, look at contexts of other modifications like phosphorylation, which I'm trying to indicate here. So I want to briefly review a, um, a new method that we have developed, uh, which is called UB clipping. And um, I want to quickly show you what we can do with this. And it actually came back to another dub. And it came back to another viral dub. This time is not SARS-2, but it's actually foot and mouse disease virus, FMDV, that very similar to SARS-2 has a leader protease that is important to cleave viral proteins and, and other proteins in the cell, but it also cleaves ISG-15. And this became the project of Kirby um, and um, was helped initially by Jonathan. Um, and Kirby and Jonathan, they basically figured out that this was a, a DISG elase. But Kirby is a mass spectrometrist, and he did an experiment that I never understood why he did this. Um, but he found that if he just takes normal free ISG-15 and he adds LB Pro to it, then something gets cleaved, and that's the little GG here at the end. So in other words, LB Pro cleaves ISG-15, but it doesn't cleave like a dub after the GG. It actually cleaves before the GG. So before the GG modifier and, and the GG then stays on the lysine residue. And that's a really cunning strategy of this virus, how to deal with ISG-15. Because first of all, it, it incapacitates the entire ISG-15 system because it, it removes a very important GG that you would need to put it onto proteins. And it also generates substrates which are no longer modifiable because the lysine residue is now already GG modified. So what LB Pro does, it turns the ISG ohm of a cell into a GG ohm. And we can deal with ohms because we have, for example, good antibodies for a GG modification. So we put a single point mutation based on the structure that Kirby generated. We put a single point mutation in LB Pro and generated a enzyme which was much better for cleaving ubiquitin. And we call this ubiquitin clipase and or AB Pro star. And this now becomes our way of looking at these very difficult branched polyubiquitin chains because we can now take this tree of ubiquitin, digest it, and actually generate different species of ubiquitins that have distinct modifications. They are either at the end no further modification, they have one GG, but if they're branched, they would have two GGs. And of course, we also generate the GG modified proteome. So what does that look like? This is a standard HeLa or HCT cell lysate treated with LB Pro, ubiquitination goes away, monoubiquitin is coming up. If you now take this anti-GG antibody, and you know, this is this antibody that you would do these rather expensive experiments in mass spec with, you would never think about putting this on a gel, but you can actually do this now. You can use the anti-GG antibody on a Western blot now because all of these proteins that have been removed here all have GGs exposed and are now basically very nicely reactive with this antibody. So the cool thing is your protein is going to be in here. It doesn't have ubiquitin anymore, but it has all the GGs now exposed. And I think that is where it's going to be a really cool methodology to look at your particular protein, which is not going to be in a smear anymore, but your protein is going to be just at a very nice size down here, and you can IP it from this 
and send it to your MOSPEC department. So LB Pro converts the ubiquitom into a GGOM and the molecular weights of the proteins will be collapsed to their original size, and that should really allow you to look at ubiquitination site mapping um, uh, for, for proteomic analysis. Um, we were interested in not so much into proteomes, but or you know, GGOMs, we were interested in ubiquitin. And by just doing a triptych digest on this ubiquitin down here, we can effectively get exactly the same numbers that you would get from a full um, um, peptide analysis. But of course, you don't have any background if you just cut out this band and do an aqua analysis on this. There's no background from any other protein, which is pretty cool. Um, what we want to do is to purify this band and ask the question, OK, let's do an intact mass on these proteins so we can really understand what we get here. And what we found, even in the standard cell lysate like HCT cells, we actually identified branched ubiquitins, which were triple branched, lots of ubiquitins that was double branched, um, and, and other species um, as well. So when we do this analysis in different cell lines, you can see these results were very similar. I just want to explain to you what this actually means here. Right, so this is standard hex cell lines. Um, and we see a lot of unmodified ubiquitin, um, ubiquitin which is in chains, so mo modified on one side, but also really always quite a lot of ubiquitin which had been modified twice. So we can turn this into a very simple numbers game now. So let's say there's five ubiquitins here. This is close to 50%, five unmodified, four modified with one GG and uh, double GG, that's one branched ubiquitin. So we can now put this back together and we have to conclude here that at least 30% of, of all ubiquitin in a cell is in a branched chain. And that's much more than I expected. And then we have other ubiquitins that might be in shorter chains, but we don't see a lot of very long chains. Of course, we can sort of um, make uh, longer chains and we can put more in these branched chains. There's a lot of histone monoubiquitination, I guess. Um, but really, uh, we, we, we can't do really much, uh, much more with this because we really, for this, we need to measure how long ubiquitin chains are in the first place. And, you know, we have some methods for this now, so this is something we can, we can do. So I would like to finish now by just letting you know that ubiquitin clipping is a great new method to study ubiquitin modifications and it gives new insights into ubiquitin chain architecture. Uh, here at Rehi, we are now um, establishing, re-establishing these ubiquitin uh, mass spec methods. So this has been um, uh, taking a bit of time, as you can imagine. Um, but really, I've got a wonderful team of of, uh, of postdocs now that are exploiting this and really already putting this to the next level. So these two guys are only interested in cellular ubiquitination, and they are growing their cells at the moment in 96 well plates to get complete linkage analysis um, of, of all linkages in, in cells, which is which is pretty cool. Um, and the, the hope at the end that we will really be able to comprehensively and routinely characterize any ubiquitinated sample in a, in a pretty hopefully good throughput um, as well. And of course, my colleague Andrew Webb is heading the MASPEC facility at Rehi, and this is a, uh, really an amazing facility. OK, so that comes to my acknowledgement. So I'm not sure I mentioned this, but for uh, 10 years, I've been at the MRC LMB in Cambridge, um, and I was uh, really blessed with having absolutely amazing scientists in my lab from start to finish. Um, you can see that many of them are now uh, lab heads um, um, in, in many good places. And I'm really, uh, and you know, once your once your students become lab heads, then you really think, and you're really getting old, I feel. Um, but it's really great to see that uh, um, the careers of these uh, people and and watching this. Um, MRC has some amazing facilities as well. Maspec in particular, I want to mention Stefan Freund at the NMR department. Um, we haven't done much NMR since I moved to Rehi, and this this needs to change. But uh, this really was an amazing uh, collaboration that, that we had going there with Stefan and also for biophysics. There were amazing biophysicists that helped in many of our, um, in, in, in our papers. The work I described was from Malta, who was part of the DUP Alliance, um, which again is shown here. 
Um, and Kirby uh, has done the UB clipping. He's actually a postdoc in Brando's lab, and, and I think he's on the job market, so he should be a very good catch, I should think. Um, I would like to then also just quickly move to, to Wehi and acknowledge the teams that have assembled now. So I think we are about 38 people now in the division, and um, of course this is heavily um, um, increased by all these amazing collaborators uh, and, and real collaborations that we've established here at Wehi, um, within Wehi and also um, in the precinct. And as I said, we have uh, continuously um, positions open um, and have um, potentially, uh, well, definitely have a, another lab head position open and I'm hoping that some of you will apply. Um, we are funded by numbers funding bodies, including in particular the Australian government, of course. Um, and it's getting pretty late now, and I would like to finish here and thank you for your attention. <laughs>